being carried on the back of a mountain of a man and a hairstyle. It's Feed Your Please, which is sometimes a heinous trip at Warp 5, but really not today. Still, my name is Joseph. And I'm your co-host, Peter. And this is a special episode of Feed Your Please being recorded as a consequence of our lovely Patreon subscribers. Thank you, Patreon subscribers. You are the best. And as one of our special installments for all of you, we've decided to offer a season one review of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Since Peter and I have now both fully watched it, and we figure this is a good topic for a Star Trek podcast, maybe a little bit. What do you think, Peter? Strange New Worlds is a very fitting title for this television show. Yeah, there's some some out there fringe sci-fi going on, but I think more importantly, uh, this is a very foreign, very exotic, very uncomfortable place that secret robot has had to to force itself to go to to move so far off the beaten path of absolute rancid dog shit <laughs> as evidenced by the later seasons of discovery and 100 percent of picard before we before we even start to touch the quality which i share some of your skepticism of how it is that uh, bad robot was able to play against type and that type being actual manure how it premiered i don't think can be understated i think that the just merely how they decided to roll the show out is itself a meta story worth exploring you know let us go back a few months it's may 2022 a simpler time a happier time picard season two is going on and it is so bad that even the people who are apologetic about New Trek in general cannot defend it. This it's so bad that they are showing clips or they're trying to get hype on season three, which is going to be a radical departure from what the first two seasons and the, the essential premise of Picard is, which was not supposed to be Next Generation Part 2. Uh, they have failed so bad they have now had to smash the emergency glass because secret hideout is under so much pressure and scrutiny from paramount cbs what whatever the hell the parent organization is called at this place like stock pricing is in a free fall and there is no more denying that this new trek is not finding its footing and that they are hemorrhaging viewers at uh, a network alarming rate now obviously they were pretty well aware of this problem even before Picard season two is handed to them and they realize it's, it's about to get a lot worse because they were starting to get this heat when discovery was on. And so what they did was reach back to the one firm, correct decision. New Trek creators have made, which was how they cast Christopher Pike in discovery season two and say, well, what if we just pluck him out and we just do a show with him as the captain of the Enterprise and just do classic Star Trek? Maybe that's the way we reset ourselves. And so it started this show getting made in motion. And they realized how bad Picard was that they premiered this over the same time that Picard season two was ending. Mind you, this is all happening on Paramount Plus and streaming services do not do this. They do not place their premier products to overlap with each other. They place them in a fashion so that you are compelled to subscribe longer by being watching one and then another and then another. They space it out so there's new content that'll keep your sub over the long term. No, no. They were so needing to patch the wound they had created themselves with Picard Season 2. They had Strange New World start in the middle of Picard so that there would be something else for you to watch instead. And I feel like they really nailed it. As strange as it is to say. What would you give this as far as a overall grade? I would give it a solid B. It is a B student. 
but it is not a B student in that it is above average throughout the entirety of its 10 episodes. It is five A's and five C's in my, in my estimation or an A plus and a D, you know, so it averages out to a B. Uh, I think that there are a ton of problems with the show. I think that the pacing is problematic. I think the writing is scattershot. The continuity was at times good and at other times very bad. Uh, I feel like this was a product of not only COVID era pro- production, which is to say a lot of writers writing on their own and there's no writer's room. There's no like ideas being bounced off each other. There's no like consistent sort of threading of things that comes with the, that kind of environment where you're doing the creative work, but also the still, uh, shall we say shallow pool of creative talent that they're drawing upon and asking maybe to, to do some things that uh, they're not really well suited to do. But despite those problems and more, the show succeeds more often than it fails and does so primarily on the strength of the performance of Anson Mount as Christopher Pike. A lot of the show is highly dependent on the fact that that man understands the assignment. He understands what he is, not only just the character is supposed to play, but what that character is supposed to mean to the story at hand. And I was going to say, because that fundamental element is nailed, I think the show ultimately succeeds. Go on. I was very surprised that Pike was not better received by myself through it because I really expected him to be the sole thing that I clung to. And I feel like for a lot of these episodes, it was actually Spock, uh, Bob, is it Bob Peck? Ethan, Ethan Peck. Peck. Ethan the Peck. Grand, the grandson uh, of, uh, of Gregory Peck. One of, the, one of the great actors of his generation. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, like, some real Hollywood royalty here. Uh, yeah. I, I felt that it was his performance sealing the deal on a lot of these episodes. As you're sitting here talking, uh, laying your initial line of criticism down, I'm forced to think to myself, this is what they should have paraded out in the first place. What if Discovery and Picard didn't exist and bad robots foray into television via secret hideout was this? I think any criticisms that I could have against this would have been completely laid to rest because it was initial outing. Agreed. I am hundred percent. I think if this was their premier product to establish a new time slot, uh, on the timeline to work in, it would have been amazing. There is so much stuff lingering in this baggage. You have to bring in from discovery, uh, and other just little quirks. Like it's, it's stuff that, I feel like the writer's room should have had a better idea of what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. And as this is, uh, I think you'll agree, this is secret hideout waving the white flag and giving up and saying, fine, have your goddamn Star Trek. You know, we give up. It is. And this is. It's interesting because I think so much of the decline in major pop culture franchises creatively that a lot of people have witnessed um, has to do with the creatives that are presently in charge of them feeling that they're too good for what they're being asked to make. And when you think you're too good for what you're being asked to make, you want to subvert expectations. You want to do different things. You want to spite the people who made it popular because you don't want to make this. You want to make something else. You want to make something that's, you know, specific to your, your, uh, priors when it comes to what the things that you like to watch or see or swinging or on Patrick Stewart specifically, you want to use the medium, not to tell a story that the people are there to see, but to turn it into a political platform to virtue signal or try to send a message out where, uh, that's not the, the, the place for it. Agreed. Absolutely. And like you said, the business reality set in, and these same people were forced to reckon with not having to act like they were too good to make the thing that they were supposed to make in the begin to begin with, and then did so. And they can turns out they can do it if they are so motivated to do so. And 
yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what to make of that except to say that that it's important to keep that in mind. That this was always within their capacity. The exact same producers, the exact same writing teams, the, the exact same production teams that make all of the unwatchable dog shit that has plagued the Star Trek fans' existence now going on something like six years. That, those who are all still there, not a fucking one of them lost their jobs. But they finally got a fucking appointed stare from Paramount and someone tapping on the watch and suddenly... They made something that approximates what folks were anticipating to begin with. I And I have no answer for this. Contracts, Les Moonviz. When Les Moonviz departed CBS, uh, he gave Secret Robot Bad, or I'm sorry, Bad Robot Secret Hideout an airtight stranglehold on the Star Trek franchise that uh, has been possible for Paramount to escape and they've just basically been held hostage on this. I want to talk characters. Uh, Anson Mount as Christopher Pike, known quantity. We knew what we were getting. If there's anything, the, the best part of Discovery, uh, I really liked Lorca. I was sad that, to see him go. And again, I, I liked the first, most of season one, parts of season two on Discovery. I think that there was potential there had they gave that story one season tops uh had they made that an alternate timeline had they not canonized uh the nonsense that they did but you get this byproduct which is christopher pike like you said the dude nailed it to the degree where he got his own he actually got his own spinoff unlike that section 31 bullshit that was promised what five times and never yeah, from Michelle Yeoh, never happened. Yeah. Uh, I watched this entire run of Strange New Worlds with my wife, who was there for all of my experiences with Discovery. She bailed on Picard because she is not a moron like I am. Smart um, lady. <laughs> and uh, her big her big comment to me by the end of it was. They should not have given him the hair he did. And I said, well, let me tell you what. I think you're the only person on the planet Earth that did not like his hair. And she's like, I'm not saying it doesn't look good. It looks great. It just looks too good to the point where it's distracting. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that hair is too Fair excellent. Enough. You know what? I'm going to say this is uh, Anson Mount's hair in his capacity as Pike is. I think will go on to become as infamous as seven of nine in the silver cat suit and uh, to Paul Jolene Blaylock's to gilf's nipples on the curtain in carbon creek like that that in the in the, in the far woke future this will be over sexualizing <laughs> it's just, it's that hair how mm-hmm. scandalous we'll, that, we'll be we'll be like almost edwardian in, in our in our like fanning <laughs> ourselves we'll have the vapors i i really i can't emphasize enough that pike is just my favorite thing about the show lapping everything else he may very well be my favorite captain now just based on this 10 episodes he embodied the character of the starfleet ideal you know like if pike is pike is real was a relatively undefined but important canon figure within star trek overall and you know he's he's not kirk right kirk's the rebel he's not picard picard's the diplomat he's not cisco cisco's the warrior you know, he's not Archer. Archer's the explorer. He is the manifestation of the ideal of Starfleet, le- other centered leadership and selflessness. That is what he is. He is he is the, the captain every other captain aspires to be, including everyone I just mentioned. And the story that they give him in this season is perfect. It's It's basically told across... What, four different episodes? The pilot, the episode six, the one where he goes to the planet with with the doom the doomed child that goes into the golden throne. Um the the finale. Maybe it's just those three that really are the tent poles of his story, right? I feel like it comes up way more than yeah. what you're giving. It's it's it not it comes up more but introspection and conversation, but they're it's haunting images and it's 
looks off in the distance. You, you see it's weighing heavy. And what's cool about his dark fate is that this is stuff that's laid out in the DNA of the show from, uh, what was it, Menagerie? Men- the the Menagerie, yeah. The, the original pilot of the original series was The Cage, and then it was repurposed as an episode of the actual original series called The Menagerie. So something that would be very easy in current situations to say, oh, God, everybody has to have a terrible backstory. Everybody has to have that thing they're brooding on. Like, there's there's none of that here. Like, this is this is as canon as it gets. And kudos to them for recognizing that this is uh, some some really great storytelling waiting to happen. Plus. It was all uh, established initially with the fucking stupid time crystals and discovery. So, like, you're not even really having to waste time setting it up. You're just hitting the ground running and, and moving with this thing. My criticisms of Pike, I, I, I'm not as fanboy on Pike as you are. Like, I, I like him. I enjoy him. Um, I expressed this on air before that I think, especially towards the beginning of the season, he he doesn't really command. He surveys the bridge and he takes someone else's suggestion like and that's his leadership style for like the first three maybe four episodes yeah his personality is not super well established until the mid-season comedy episode believe it or not when he has the he figures out how to deal with the new species that they're Mm. trying to have you know join the federation spock amok yeah 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 yeah. i forgot about that part that's a and i want to talk that's that's the episode where you figure out that this man is a generational talent at his. He's the Tom Brady of Starfleet Cor- of Starfleet captains, you know, like that. That's when, you know, is like this is the dude that every other dude wishes he was. And not to jump ahead too much, but taking his performance in the diplomacy and that and everything else you said about how this guy is the even hand. This guy is the paladin. This guy is the ideal embodiment and knowing that he is a great person for the job and how they twist that uh, in quality of mercy, which is the episode 10 and how ultimately the best Starfleet can put forward is not necessarily the right or the you might be the best at the job, but you might not be the right person for that play. Like Tom Brady is not the guy you run the option play with. You know, you want the court, you want the guy who's re- willing to like push aside the linebacker and get the first down. We'll get to the finale, which is by far the best episode of the season, uh, particularly as a fan of the original series. That was just actually the most competently written and shot <laughs> episode as well. Like the production was very good on that. And I think it was because it happened late and probably got produced after people were a little less COVID freaked out. Mm hmm. As, as a suspicion I have. Let's um, pop down to number one. Uh, Rebecca Ro- Stam- No, just Rebecca Ramone now, right? Yeah, Rebecca Romaine once, uh, once known as a mystique. <laughs> really, mm-hmm. like if you want to, if you want to take it, take it back to uh, twenty years ago, nerd stuff. Do they give her a first? It, they do give her a first, uh, an actual Una. name, Una. Yeah, Una Chin Riley. Yeah, number one. Let's <laughs> see why yeah. that's what he goes with. I. I didn't get anything I, from her. I just was not impressed. I'm glad that they were able to salvage the character after that stupid short trek of her and Spock singing in the turbo lift. Yeah, where she's like weirdly flirty with him. I like the casting. I like they got somebody who had traditionally been a talent for their looks and did not cast them based on their looks. Uh, I like that she's in this age that's not like matronly and stoic, but not like seven to nine to Paul, just TNA floating around. Um, yeah, I mean, let's let's call it as we see it. We're it's uncommon to see clearly middle aged women in Hollywood doing just non sexual things. You know, I like, like it. Yeah, like it was kind of nice that like Rebecca Romaine could just play this character. 
Uh, I just didn't think that I didn't really get much from what her character was supposed to really be doing on this show. We do the big uh, reveal that she's a genetically engineered mutant with superhuman powers. Yeah. And they do that like episode fucking two or whatever. Three. They do that episode three. I didn't need that stuff. But the fact that she was essentially illegal uh, becomes such an important part of the last episode of the season that like I get it. I, I, I like that she I could go for her being genetically engineered. I didn't need the superpower byproduct. Well, and th- that is one of the flaws of the show. And that is every single fucking character has a tragic backstory, maybe two. Uh, two in the case of La Nunian Singh or uh, Drummer <laughs> from The Expanse, as you mm-hmm. pointed out. Yes, um, we'll, we'll get to her, but they it's a it's a trope of modern Hollywood writing is that you have to have tragic backstories to the point where it becomes almost like a comedy bit, because when they get to the doctor's fucking tragic backstory, you're like, oh, Jesus, really? You too? Like, yeah. <laughs> can you spare no one here? Like Spock's got his problem. Pike's got his problem. Lon's got her problem. Number one's got her problem. Even fucking Uhura has to have a goddamn tragic backstory. Her parents yeah. like fucking died in a car accident, accident somehow. And then you get to the doctor's like, I have a dark past too. Like, stop it. Get some help. What's get wrong with your department? Are you guys being vetted? Let's flip over to Spock, speaking of uh, pulling a character out of the fucking gutter. Yeah, his portrayal of Discovery was not good, and then it was way better here. It was like a different character. I think he was my favorite character. Uh, The sideburns are terrible, uh, but, you know, they drop all the dyslexia stuff. They back off slightly off of the turmoil of, am I Vulcan? Am I human? You know, how do I look at myself? There was the one... I think it was uh, the Serene Squall, which focused back in on that. But uh, I liked his portrayal. I liked his steadiness. He brought the rage out in the right moments. Um, his marital woes worked. So yeah. the, the biggest surprise to me was the jokey. Was it Spock Amuck where he body swaps his wife with some fucking Gilligan's Island plot? And it was good, though. It was funny. It was Star Trek. It felt like an original series plot. You know, it like worked. it worked. And that was what's impressive to me. I agree. He just felt like Spock. He felt like the character of Spock, but a little younger, which is what he's supposed to be. Like, he's not as quiet and as assured as he will be in the future as the veteran Spock. He's Lieutenant Spock. He's still he knows some things, but he also doesn't know other things. And I also like. And this is just time and experience and understanding uh, kind of seeping in his portrayal of having a personality and a sense of humor and a little bit of access to his emotions, particularly because he is a half breed Vulcan human is, I think, the best part of his portrayal. That feels like kind of where Spock would be if he were, quote unquote, real, right? Like he's able to ah, comedy. He's a little he's very dry, you know? He's very distant, but he's there's still a little bit more there than you think he would get from like a normal Vulcan. And it's because he's also human. I like that. I, and I felt it in his performance. And that's a credit to to him as an actor. And, and it's also, I think, at least a credit to some of the writers who understood that that is where they kind of needed to go with him. Um, another part of the show I, I did not expect to enjoy, but did was Nurse Chapel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, okay. So they're going to nurse Chapel, and this is how they're going to build in this stupid love triangle. And I'm sure she'll be like a fucking writer self insert SJ, SJW. I really thought that. Like, this is where it's going to get bad. And it turns out she was secretly one of the best characters on the show, up to and including where she like goes and makes sure she tells Spock, I am opting out of a romantic triangle because I know you're too honorable a man to do that. And I would never, you know, cast aspersions on your character by pursuing you knowing you're too honorable to do that. Like that, well, that actually really made me like her where I'm like, Oh wow. Okay. That's cool. (laughs) She's got some real Yas queen, a little tinge of Mary Sue, right? 
Uh, just a little. Just a little taste. She, whatever. When do they get occupied? Was it Serene Squall? And then she's there and she's got the hypo sprays and she's beaten uh, pirates asses and then knocking yeah. them out. And, I, and that episode's a C for me because that part of it was so kind of sloppy. And how that whole like, how is it that everyone on the ship suddenly got captured? Why are you running around like, you know, barely making it by with a hypo spray? Like, none of this makes a lot of sense. She sealed the deal for me in all those who wander episode nine. And that's the one where they're on the frozen planet with the uh, was it the nocturne was the, the wreckage of the other ship. Correct. And that's and the, one with the baby Gorn. Yes. Baby Gorn chest bursters blow up and she loses her shit and she freezes up. And there is a weakness there that is very real. That is a uh, <laughs> I am not prepared for this. I'm scared shitless. And I am not an action hero right now. And I think them building that into her made her seem very real. And I appreciated the the, the flaw there. It, it grounded her and it it excused a lot of the past writing that they had done on her. They could have in a number of different spots made her insufferable. Whether it was Spock Muck, when, you know, she had her whole plot line about she didn't want feelings of this guy and then kind of like wound up in this awkward position and things really did not work out for her. Or when she, you know, had the whole plot line with the pirates and then goes to Spock and be like, no, I'm not doing this because I know you wouldn't and that would just not be acceptable. Or she's dealing with chest bursters and she's freaking out and she's like on top of a bio bed and she's just has a, has a hypo spray and a prayer and doesn't know what the fuck to do over and over they they made the correct choice to keep her relatable to the audience rather than insufferable which has been the trend over the last several years so it was very nice to not have that happen how'd you feel about drummer i feel like I liked her more before the drummer thing got pointed out and I started looking up clips of drummer and saw how good drummer could be. I'm like, Oh, Oh, this is like discount drummer. This is, this is dollar store drummer. <laughs> and it's the dramatic eyeliner yes. that gets me mm-hmm. like for drummer. It's a whole ass look, right? Like she's got a whole ass look. She's going for it's on purpose, right? Part of her personality. But on Lon, she's like the no nonsense security chief, and she's got fucking time to do the dramatic eyeliner. Like, no, mm-hmm. like Lon is the kind of officer that shows up with with no makeup on. She doesn't have time for femininity. She is too like rigid. She should be th- the character they wanted Lon to be is the is the woman that's built like a fucking Miami Dolphins linebacker who has spent every moment since barely escaping the Gorn ready to throw down with these monsters, learning their habits. She's like hard as a rock and she definitely does not have time for dramatic eyeliner. And instead it's this. And it's like, it's not, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it. Drummer is who you actually want. I think that they did a disservice to her by making everybody else have the aforementioned uh, tragic backstory. Yeah, Hers is so them. tragic that like, just let her be the one with the fucking baggage and let everybody else be a post scarcity utopia um, space cadet. My daughter has cancer. My entire family and everyone I know was torn open and used as breeding pits for the Gorn. The Gorn Ooh. stuff specifically. And I mean, there's three or so episodes that really touch on it. Like, that's some real dark shit. And I'm not saying it's out of place for for Star Trek. Uh, but it's certainly an outlier. And I'm willing to give it to Strange New World that they're they're able to tell that story convincingly. Uh, a lot of time, you know, a lot of the stuff we criticized in Voyager and Enterprise is that like. It's too PG. It, it space is too clean. Space is too safe. Like that. That's some alien slash aliens level of horror and gore that goes on there and tying her into it. Like I like her in the Gorn capacity stuff. Somehow I liked her in number one. Uh, what do they call the team where death where fun goes to die? <laughs> yes. Them fucking around on, uh, on their little shore leave. Like that was good, but 
I, I do, I'm always going to like the canon of the whole thing with the gum when they're on the transporters. You're absolutely 100%. right. 100%. That was just very clever. I will say that's my favorite part of this entire season one is finding out that when you transport, it reconstitutes the flavor in your gum. She's not my favorite, but she's certainly not the worst. And I don't feel like she really dragged any scenes down. What's his name? Heimer? Hemnall? Hemmer? Oh, he's Hemmer an Andorian, the, right? Yeah. you know. Well, he's a offshoot of the Andorian race. Something you'll learn about in uh, Enterprise, actually, which was what was so clever. He is he is a deep lore pick for what he is. He is not an Andorian. I did not like him for 90% of the uh, episodes and until I think all those who wander and then maybe Elysian kingdom. Uh, I don't know. It, 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 the dude was too cool for school. And I think part of his scenes got dragged down because they would continue to pair him with fucking Uhura, who was the worst. Yeah, I told you. You're going to want to uh, fast forward through every scene she's in. Yeah, it taints it. Ultimately, it's not someone we need to worry about. The way he exits the show, I thought was good. And by the end, uh, there was something enjoyable about the character. But uh, by and large, I found it to be pretty insufferable. Yeah, it was. They were trying too hard. You know, they were, they tried too hard to build him up into this super cool figure. Zen Archer. But, yeah. And when you do that and you don't feel like you've allowed your space self space to earn it, it comes up as insufferable but they did that because they knew they were killing them off right so they felt like the force march mm-hmm. their way into character development instead of doing what they should have done which is just kind of let it happen and let the death be a surprise but because they were forcing him so hard it made his death in that ninth episode extremely predictable you know like it would be one thing if I felt like Hemmer was part of this crew and part of this show. Instead, he felt like he was definitely a slightly distant from it. Mm-hmm. And unlike everyone else, did not feel particularly integrated in what was going on. And so when you had the the aliens episode that it ends with his tragic death was like, oh, OK, yeah, that makes that. I said, like, that makes sense. This is the guy to kill. Like, this is it. They, they set him up to be the guy to kill. Speaking of uh, aliens, uh, on one hand, you got Lon slash drummer. On the other hand, you've got uh, not Vasquez, both <laughs> both competing to be Vasquez from aliens. What was her or- name? Martinez uh, Ortega Ortega uh, Joker. I she was clearly a comedic element. I think they misused her heavily and her popping off with the Marvel style quips at the frequency she, she was cost Kirk captain points in my, in my book. I don't, she was don't a little know. too flip, right? Like she needed to be at the Tom Paris level of bad boy, but it was a little bit beyond that. And it became a bit noticeable. It was interesting to use it in the last episode because what she was doing is who she was representing a stand in for a different original series character that said almost the exact same lines in places. And so her being very combative about the Romulans was actually a homage to the original series. Hmm. So I let that one go because I saw what they were doing, but for even in some of the other episodes, they were a little too just like Pike was just letting it go on a little bit too much, right? A little too passive in reining her in because they wanted the yuck yuck. The show's not I perfect. keep thinking what you're saying, comparing her to Paris. And I think that if she had a streak of negativity in her. It would have served the character well, but she had the sterling optimism that I don't know, kind of clashed with her boisterousness and, and presented her as kind of annoying in the scenes. Like, I don't think the character itself was annoying, but her contributions felt annoying. I think if she was a little bit more cynical maybe a little bit more practical or yeah, just she, she either needed to be younger and therefore like fresh out of the Academy or she needs to have some level of ballast to this, this part of her personality and some kind of, like you said, practicality or cynicism. She's either a veteran that knows Pike extraordinarily well and they're just like homies and she's just his pilot. And that's just the way it is. And because he's Pike, he gets who he wants and he's just, she's just very comfortable a joker to the shepherd. Yes, she's either the Joker for this ship and for Mass needed, Effect, by the way, and they needed to make it so that like Joker, he's got enough seriousness in him 
and especially when under the gun such that you buy it or she's like super new. And so like the, 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 the wonder hasn't worn off yet. And that's why she's so kind of out there. And they really, they didn't pick a lane with that and hope, you know, this is where a place they can improve, right? Like the th- great, the great part is they could easily adjust and say, Oh, we just need to, to give her a little bit more edge or we need to make more clear. She's kind of like fresh one or the other. They can still make that choice because they didn't really focus on her at all. The The only character that's not fixable is Uhura. Like, just don't have her on the show. I don't know what else to say. Drain on every scene she's in. Um, but everything else, like, that I didn't like could very well be fixed by, um, you know, a coherent writer's room. And uh, a little bit more attention paid to uh, where your, your things are hitting and missing. I really like the Doctor. He's a original series character and Benga. So the, a, he's a quiet TOS character, but he was a doctor on the enterprise in Kirk's time as well. He's the uh, assistant medical chief and he is uh, sometimes he was a, the basically did McCoy's scenes in the episodes were forced or like not on set. I think what really locked him in was the Elysian kingdom, which initially I wanted to hate and we we can maybe talk about that. Well, fuck it. Let's just talk about that episode. Now, a ridiculous, dumb episode until I was confronted with my own hypocrisy where people just said, well, that's the holodeck episode. And then any complaints or shit that I could leverage against the episode, I was forced to discard because I've given passes for much more wackier concepts. And it was just, yeah, it's a, it's a holodeck episode with a little cue splashed in there. This is well-worn ground. The set pieces looked fucking amazing. I love the costuming. Uh, and in the end, the doctor holds all his scenes down. Everybody else is acting goofy and crazy. Uh, and this guy rolls with the punches while keeping it real. I, I'm a sucker for a good holodeck episode, as you know. But I did not like that episode for two reasons. One, using a made up fairy tale where you don't have any basis of understanding of what the plot is supposed to be uh, is held it back. Like if they had used known fairy tales, but things are slightly different because his daughter is using her creative power to change the story. And that's something that the audience could know and that like you can watch Mbenga figure out would have been a much better choice. But instead, because it's an entirely made up tale, you're not really sure what's going on. You're just watching. You're kind of passive in the experience, which is not ideal. And then second, the ending is just too good. That is one of the worst endings I've ever seen in a Star Trek. Yeah, like it's like you just decided to go way too far with this and it lost all of its dramatic tension at the end. Let me shit on this episode because this, this really got my wife pissed and for, for good reasons as a parent, you are not giving your child away to a potential space demon. Okay. Especially when you, as a medical professional who have been keeping your cancer riddled child, your space cancer riddled child alive in this, uh, this pattern buffered loop, uh, illicit time chamber. No more than, what, maybe two weeks ago? Because that Elysian Kingdom, that's episode eight. Episode six, lift us, suffer where suffering cannot reach. That's the one where uh, the kid gets plugged into the computer at the end. Mm-hmm. You were just given direct evidence that there are, there are cures for your child's ailment out there, right? You were just exposed that somehow, some way you can fix this. And then make the fucking goofy decision last minute that like, oh, well, here's a space genie or maybe a demon uh, that has enslaved my crew to this cruel (laughs) fucking storybook fantasy. I'm going to entrust her off. Ridiculous. But if you are going to do that and you're going to make that play. the, the, The decision to have her time travel back as a full grown adult to reaffirm his decision and say, no, dad, you made the right choice. I'm so happy. Everything has worked out great. 
A plus, you get a gold star. This was not a bad decision at all. Like fucking weak. It has got to be. Yeah. The most amateur hour shit I've ever seen. Like that is something a sixth grader would write. That is not me. I think engaging in hyperbole. That is immature writing. Like you can't let the uncertainty hang. That's the sort of thing that like a kid would be bothered by. You watch it and you're like, what happened? Did, did you, there was a life okay? What happened? Like, and the whole point is you don't know. It's part of the uncertainty. You either build on it in stories later or, or you don't or whatever. Sure. And instead of that, what a six-year-old would do would roll in and be like, no, she comes back and everything's okay. And she's super great. And she's dating James Happily Bond. Ever. <laughs> she got to go see to the BTS concert and like all of that. She the won end. the lottery and also invested heavily in Bitcoin uh, and got out before the crash. Yeah. Okay. Either either you have to recognize like if you have if if you have to go in and say, hey, everything is cool and don't worry, then realize that is a ridiculous decision this guy made and have him not opt to let her go off to what could have been a certain uh, cure because you're going to believe in your own hand of science or leave the uncertainty there. And maybe this is something to pick back up in, uh, in season two, you want to give this guy or you want to give everybody some sort of dark backstory. Here's his real backstory. Did I just fuck up and, and send my kid off with a space monster? Let me stew and, and writhe on that question for a while, but I liked him. Uh, and then yeah, Uhura, which she was not the cat's ass in original series, man. Like, there's no getting around having to sort of address what she is, right? Like she is the stereotypical Mary Sue to the fucking T, which is even more blatant because the entire concept of Mary Sue comes from Star Trek fan fiction where a self insert character was hyper competent and everyone loved her. Like I it's, it's a little, it's almost parody, right? Like did the writers who created this hyper competent Mary Sue know that Mary Sue's come from Star Trek? Was this a meta commentary or was this incompetence? I'm not sure, but that's what she is. And you get the feeling that it's, that is the Yas queen element of the show like what they avoided doing with chapel what they avoided doing with all of their other female cast members and there's have, a lot of them and, and it's, there's a nice split of the masculine and feminine energy in this show and there's a there's a good amount of female cast members and they all have well-established characters who have real roles and flaws and and positive things about them and you see them and they interact with others and interact with them each other and all of that and then this outlier way over here is is uhura who feels like a late millennial self-insert by a writer who really wanted like yeah it's queen oh yeah you're you're the best you're, you're the better than all these men and everything like that's just the vibe the entire time she's on the fucking show i know i'm sorry everybody this is not the show you come for to hear this we don't do this very often you just can't fucking avoid it here sorry it's true and the hard part of it is again you're dealing with a unknown quantity like this is not how uhura acts or behaves in any capacity through any of the original series products or movies so you've got this completely wildly different character than what she is going to turn into and i don't know at some point if she's gonna like hit her head real hard on a on a banister or slip on some ice and come out a, a changed person but uh, I think the character would have been just fine as a wet behind the ears recruit who wasn't really sure if Starfleet was the place for her and needed to, to you know, that whole thing with Hemnall or Heimer or whatever his name is like Hemmer. Yeah, his his parting speech, you know, set up roots, flourish. This is good for you. You need to be here like all that stuff worked great. I think there could have been a solid character had you cut the intellect and the miracle workings that puts even Wesley Crusher to shame. Yeah, it's uh, just an insane side. level of hyper competence at all things as someone who knows nothing to the, to the extent that it became 
just awful to to watch. And starting from episode two on, like that is just her. She holds that one down, and every time she's on screen, it's the same shit. And you know, it it's really a addition by subtraction if you just take her out of the equation. And the show is else? much better with her just not there. Yeah. Anybody else for us to talk about? Uh, character wise, I mean, I do like what they did with having George Kirk, who is actually a character that didn't make that up for the show. Like George Kirk is James Kirk's brother and showed up on the George original Kirk series. is actually Guy from uh, Galaxy Quest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the I mustache like is actually canon as well, because when the, he showed up in the original series, it was just it was just a uh, uh, William Shatner, but with a shitty mustache. on. <laughs> <laughs> so like the fact that they kept that as a bit was good. Uh, one other thing I, I want to, one other kind of meta thing I want to talk about is the music. The show has very good music. The show has very good everything. And, and what I want to talk about is the ship itself. You can take discovery, you can take Picard trash stories, bad acting, whatever. What I can't take away specifically from discovery picard they cut some real corners especially in the space combat but like all the shit looked cool yeah and it was nice to finally see like stuff i care about getting this big budget glossy badass set dressing uh treatment the uniforms look great enterprise looks looks roomy (laughs) like pike's quarters is the most that man fucks, right? Like, <laughs> and we do see that. Like, Pike is a very charming man. This man has charisma at 18. He started with the high score. You know, he's got his fucking age appropriate girlfriend that he sees in the in the premiere and in the in the finale of the season. And he he lays the, his old girlfriend and you go to his cabin, you go to his his quarters that's got the fucking fireplace and the full kitchen in it, and he's always cooking with fucking smooth Kinda jazz 60s on the back. retro word. feeling too, you know? Like yeah. there's some there's some neat, groovy stuff going on. Yeah. Um, that man that man fucks. And his whole vibe with that whole like big old quarters that he's got that's like the swank bachelor pad is fantastic. Well, along with like the groovy kind of retro look i think that starts tying into the music i think they did a nice job of making it star trek music uh but doing it right by 2022 it, the the only time they dove, dove real deep on making it sound 60s was in the finale because it was literally a shot you know a, a reshot version of balance of terror so they used the same camera style they used the same lighting style on the face like the silhouette lighting style across the eyes and then they use the same musical uh uh uh, stings like dun 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 you know like that that classic tos tension build before the commercial break they they (laughs) leaned in hard there but otherwise it was a nice mix i agree i agree uh and like i said part of the money you know there's not it there's I, i did not see any cut corners in terms of visual effects um set pieces the costuming the, the last episode quality of mercy when future kirk or uh pike comes back rocking the fucking movie uniforms oh yeah the slick burgundy uniform oh Just that was in great. my pants i wanted I, more of that <laughs> wow wow what to t- they took a great looking costume and somehow made it better like if if Pike has to live and fuck up the timeline to get us to a point where those <laughs> uniforms, happen, then it's worth whatever the cost to the Federation was. Yeah, billions right? died, but for the right reasons, because that man <laughs> looked good in that uniform. Um, so you, you've got a solid crew. You've got uh, some familiar faces. You've got some new faces. You got some people that are getting cycled out here. Specifically, I think you're gonna be seeing Scotty next season if next season does happen. Uh, uh, not true. Not true. Uh, I do have something to update you on. Next season was shooting before the first season came out and is done and is coming out sometime in 2023. They literally shot. They shot the second season in January of 2022. Like it. It is confirmed done. And uh, they cast Carol Kane 
as the new chief engineer. You might remember Carol Kane as the landlord of Kimmy Schmidt in the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Never saw that. She's fucking hysterical. And they are clearly going in for like a old battle axe lady who's a chief engineer who's like probably like fixes shit by banging a goddamn frying pan into it, mm. you know, type of like attitude. Like what they were trying to go with with Tig Notaro but failed. Mm. <laughs> I think that's what they want is like, we'll get an older comedian who can just be super like New York hard edged lady. And that's what we're going to do instead of going for Scotty, which I think was wise. Like keep, we've got enough of that going on. We got chapel. We've got Spock. We even have Mbanga to a degree. We've got Kirk. We're going to see more of him. That's enough. I need Scotty and McCoy and, and Sulu, you know, like let's, let's let we what we've got happen, you know? I want to talk about pacing. That's the biggest strike I have against the show, uh, especially the earlier episodes. The Children of the Comet, which was the ridiculous, like using music to talk to the comet. The, the, Terrible the episode that I feel was scripted by a fourteen-year-old who won a contest. Yes, I exactly thought the same thing. Like this is written by a teenager. It's so amateur on every level up to and including how every character has to explain everything that's going on on screen and not allow the the viewer in any way to experience what's going on uh, and be treated with any kind of, of dignity. Ghosts up of to- Alaria, which is the, um, the, the, the ghost cloud thunderstorm episode, right? Yeah, that's the one where number one has to solve the sun. Everyone's addicted to sunlight. Yeah. And she like, <laughs> you a new think she's on the street. They call it sunlight. The, you think that she got co-opted, but it's actually that she just knew there was a problem. Yeah. And so she's going around trying to solve it. You don't find out until halfway through the episode of like, no, I didn't get co-opted. I just know I'm the only one who's immune because I'm illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, everyone's like, Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> Even Strange New Worlds, which was episode one, and that's where uh, they got to go rescue number one. And uh, P- uh, Pike drops the Enterprise into view and is just like, hey, outside interference, fuck uh, General Order one. They. They move the pace of the episode so fast that they are making these ridiculous Herculean uh uh feats of science and and. I don't know, metagaming and whatever else to like solve these ridiculous plots while also trying to fit like maximum interpersonal drama in to the point where it's like I almost was just tuning the main plot out because it just seemed ridiculous. Like this isn't worth my time to even think about or try to follow along with their glossing over it. So I should just do the same as well. And I, I felt that was a big disservice. It got better about the same time it was Memento Mori, the one where they're in the 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 nebula hiding from the Gorn. Yeah, the Gorn subhunt episode. They put the brakes on hard with that one, and I think it needed it. But the the first chunk of the season, man, they were just all over the place and moving way too quick on that pacing. Yeah, yeah. Th- this show had tremendous pacing problems. It had a lot of not really having a smooth story arc. Like, you compare this to House of the Dragon, and we haven't seen it, but House of the I Dragon is never a, see it. And I respect that. I really do. But it has a very smooth story arc for the first six episodes that are out at this point. And that it goes to, to show that this is a group of people who are writing together, right? Who are know they have to tell the story together that, yes, I'm writing this episode, but it has to lead in from what happened here. And it has to lead into what goes into what happened here. And that means I have to work with these folks and they have to work with the people around them. And this means we're going to have that continuity. And this just every bit of it feels like people on their fucking laptops at home in like late 2020 pre vaccine are pounding away, writing scripts, never talking to each other except through fucking Slack or DMS on Twitter or something like that. Not really having that lot of interaction and trying to like write their scripts and write their story. And then after they're done writing their script, find ways to connect it to everything else. And because of that, because of that disjointed production, it wasn't until the season was half over that it felt like it was finally starting to gel. 
because that's probably around the time where they figured out they had a problem and they needed to start changing how they were doing production. And, and on one last note on that, it makes sense when you realize they shot this in 2021, probably early 2021. And they shot season two in early 2022. So I'm hoping that just the fact that this was probably second season was probably produced under much more normal circumstances are going to help the show feel a little bit more smooth in this regard. Hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Lift us where suffering cannot reach. That's one where we've got the child prodigy who's, you know, making subspace relays out of popsicle sticks. Uh, His doctor is his dad who could fix uh, the Enterprise doctor's sick daughter with a flick of the wrist, but he won't because uh, prime factors, basically. Kind of a throwaway episode until the very end where they let this kid get fucking murdered by the computer. Plugged into the golden throne. And they show the, the other kid pulled off and he's like this withered husk and they're just like, yeah, no, it's going to be painful as hell. Like this, this is torture and this kid's in for a fate worse than death. And I thought for sure. Pike was going to beam him out or they were going to do some shit. Nope. They let the fucking kid die. And I was like, oh, damn. Well, that was a story worth watching, I guess. Yeah, I mean, the best episodes of the season to me were the finale, uh, that episode, episode six, episode five and episode one. Those were, those are my favorite. And. While I do think the finale was better overall, just as a Trek episode and as like an element using Trek to do storytelling, that is probably episode six is probably the best unique Strange New World story where it just was like doing its own thing, came up with its own concept. Mm. And yeah, like like you say, there's the element of Pike still trying to find his way to have his cake and eat it, too, which was really his story of like. He's very willing to accept his fate, but he would prefer that if he didn't have to, like there has to be a way, right? Like maybe I can get treated after I get hurt. That's what this one's about. And, you know, he's hooking up with his old girlfriend. He's thinking about his options and it's distracting him from what he should be noticing about his surroundings. Like the fuckery was obvious if he wasn't distracted by not just the booty call, but the promise of not being locked into this hell, he knows he's, he's, he's headed for. And the fact that he's essentially forced to watch this torture be conducted um, as a, a sort of penance for having failed to notice and to make those connections. Cause he was so distracted was a, quite a choice. And I really liked it. It's left him wounded and it left him not wanting to pursue Like, I need to not be distracted by what am I going to do once I'm in that fucking wheelchair? I need to focus on my job as captain of the Enterprise and this figure in Starfleet because my failure to do that is what led to this kid now being tortured for a year until he turns into dust. I like the father in that as well. I hope he comes back as some sort of a reoccurring character. Yeah, like the, the whole idea of there's people who have a moral compass and they're fighting against all of this. And the father who, you know, tried to bury his feelings about what was happening because he felt like he had to. And you know, just the idea of like, this is why this planet's outside the Federation, because they realize there's no way that everyone would be OK with this <laughs> if they were if they told them. So that's why they stay away. Right. There's a reason for their aloofness. They know they're monsters. They know they're murdering a child and that no one would be cool with this. <laughs> You didn't mention Memento Mori episode four on your good list. And again, that's the one where they're hiding in the nebula from the Gorn. And we've got like the hunt for red October going on. Yeah, it's a good one, but it's my, I would put it below the others. It's still good though. I don't know, man. Fucking skirt and a brown dwarf along the event horizon of a fucking uh, black hole. Like they do some pretty cool shit in that one. Uh, they do. In terms of like action and showing off the special effects budget. Very strong entry. At the end of the day, I think you can take the entire season one, anything that is not episode nine, ten, and and set it on a table. And these two episodes specifically can justify the existence of this entire program. Agreed. A sense of adventure and spirit and horror, the need to 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 go boldly to be Starfleet. Um, 
the the timey wimey stuff like it comes fast and hard. It's really hard. It was hard as I sat there uh, this evening talking to my wife, like trying to like refresh ourselves on on what was going on here and just remember anything past those two episodes because they were so impactful, specifically in the quality of mercy, the final episode. Uh, the interplay we get between Pike and Spock, uh, the visage of Spock mutilated and 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 paralyzed the uh, the cleverness of Spock picking up on Pike's dialogue that if Spike if Pike doesn't sacrifice himself to this dark fate he has that it's going to be Spock who pays the price and creating that that bond there that immediately ties into the menagerie and Spock going the distance he does to endanger his career and yes. potentially risk execution on behalf of Pike. Like, uh, I mean, it, it, I think it might've actually brought a tear to my eye, like powerful, powerful scripting and excellent performances. A quality of mercy is something special as far as like, apart from everything else. Um, as I already noted, the technical aspects are amazing. The music, the use of the eye highlight shotting like shots that they did that were just like how they used to shoot the original series was just in such a great touch. The visuals were great. The use of some limited space combat stuff that felt very tense was good. The playing with an existing story that you know and characters that you know and even dialogue that's the same, but all turns out very differently. Like the uh, whole concept of we're going to see an event and how it was different if different people were dealing with it was a very clever time travel idea that we haven't seen before. All of that was great, but everything you said about how the emotional fulcrum is that Pike realizes he has to accept this thing that is going to happen to him because he ultimately always has a choice as his future self tells him, but it's not really a choice for a person like him. His choice is over. Now he realizes that it no longer is a burden on him. He, this is his, his, uh, his to bear because the consequence of it falling to Spock is completely unacceptable to him. And as you said, like the idea that this builds in Spock, a sort of bond with him such that he's willing to chance death itself execution by the federation in order to save him and from from the, this fate after it has befallen him suddenly makes a lot of fucking sense and it takes a maturity and awareness to write that i loved the the juxtaposition of the um maybe i can tweak things or what if right the the, the what if element here uh what if we approach this thing with diplomacy? What if you have someone who does have the compassion and the idealism and the even hand that Pike does? What if he can make a connection with the Romulan captain? What if that Romulan captain is sick of war? What if that guy was the best possible person to have in that captain's chair that would be receptive to it and still the whole fucking thing fall apart tragically, right? Like, that and, was and, the yeah and in the original episode of balance of terror the i mean the, the brilliant part of what you just said is you the viewer know the romulan commander is that guy the entire time in similar circumstances that play out in the quote real version prevent this from happening now obviously it's different plays it's played different kirk's does his kirk thing he's more aggressive that has the effect of making it so the Romulans don't want to end up waging war. That's the whole lesson. But at the same time, the fact that he was that guy in the original episode and they retained that and kept you like feeling that in this version as well is doubly rewarding because for someone such as yourself who may not have known that that was the case. I in, didn't in the version, you know, from, you know, a million years ago, it was still extremely good. And, but for me, who is a huge fan of that 
version of the show as well, it's like, oh, this was excellent because you really made sure to hold on to that element that maybe they just did need to talk and it was going to be okay. And in this they do. And then it wasn't, but for entirely different reasons. My uh, wife, you know, we watch that episode and she's like, well, I, you know, I I still don't understand why it has to be one way or the other way. Like if you know what the future is going to be like, can't you just, and if you can travel back in time, can't you just keep changing little things one at a time until you get the way you want. And I'm like, boy, have I got an episode of Star Trek Voyager for you (laughs) that specifically deals with like, if you have all the time in the world to try and change fate, uh, is it possible? And as Kirkwood Smith will tell you, no, it is not. And, And in the end, it's, it's the way it's supposed to be, or it's arguably a much worse way, at least in Star Trek. Uh, that's all the good stuff. The bad stuff in Quality of Mercy, I am not feeling this version of Kirk at all. Yeah, neither me, neither am I. Um, I understand that people who portray Kirk probably have a strong desire to not feel like they're doing an impression of William Shatner. So they have to find a different line with the concept of the character. And I'm, I'm actually okay with that. I'm not expecting someone to no, no, go no, out no. there and do the Shatner thing. No, Bill Shatner is Bill Shatner. And that is just iconic on its own. But the core essence of Kirk as a character can be reinterpreted in a way that feels authentic while not feeling like it's, it's you know, just cosplay. I this love, guy's not it. I love what Chris Pine did. And and that's a 10 out of 10 for me. I get that you're not going to get another Chris Pine for uh, a, a supporting actor role in a TV show. But there's just nothing to latch on to with this guy. Like y- you don't need to be the 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 Shatner doesn't need to be there. But I don't feel like the Kirk was there at all. Yeah. Chris Pine was better at playing Kirk. I agree. And I didn't even really care for Chris Pine until beyond. I feel like he didn't really figure out like a version of Kirk that worked until that, but he did get it then. And then it's like calm, cool, collected, very in charge, but also very willing to do wild shit. And the, the kind of confidence that comes with knowing I can do wild shit and it's still going to work because I'm that good, you know? Mm, yeah. And he pine got there with that. And this guy is just too uh, by the book. I mean, this guy just seems like he's super rigid and he's just warlike rather than like, something special, you know, mm, good it seems point. like the guy who would be in charge of the Farragut, you know, that other ship, not the cool one, you know, what the fuck is a Farragut? Is that a location? I believe the name of an, of a British Admiral. If I recall my history, Oh, Starfleet, you're naming so crazy. Anything else in terms of, uh, presentation casting or, uh, episodes I, I would say anybody out there if you're a hater if you've been holding your breath if you're not willing to put in the time to watch a full 10 episodes find two hours to watch all those who wander in a quality of mercy like the other stuff's good the other stuff's definitely worth a watch but like those are two must sees yeah and you don't really need to see too much beyond what they're going to tell you in the pre-show credits for nine to work or for 10 to work you're really all you need to know is is Pike knowing his future, and they've laid that out well, well enough that while the extra context of the season helps, you could just watch the two of them. I honestly think that just that clip of the three minutes from uh, Spock and Muck when he's having the scene with the the aliens and he's you know being truthful with them, and then explains to to uh, God Robert April, Admiral Admiral April. Um, like this is what how had I figured out about these guys, and this is why I played it this way. And you're just gonna have to trust me. But you know, this is why it should work. It's it's again, it's him understanding the assignment, and it's the show finally figuring out in that moment what it's supposed to be. And I feel like it does pick up from that point forward because the writers finally get into what they're doing. They realize it's good, and they're making something good, and that can that can be infectious in its own way. Mm-hmm. And that's, I guess, the way I would put it is it is it grows on you. It's infectious as a show. And by the time it wraps, you're willing, you're really, really ready to watch more. And I am somewhat surprised at how it has passed 
without much comment from the kind of pop culture commentariat. Like Strange New Worlds was on, finished this run and left. And it wasn't that anyone said anything bad or said anything good. It's they said nothing at all. Which was, I was not, I was, it was unfortunate to see because it was good. And I wanted to kind of hear if some other folks shared a, a positive opinion of it. And instead you saw very few people wanting to talk about it at all. And I feel like, is it too late? What's going on? I think Again, part made- of it's that it's too late and that people <clears throat> are so deterred by Discovery and Picard that they weren't willing to give it a shot. Uh, and I think more importantly, uh, positivity doesn't get clicks. And that it's That's very true. easy in 2022 for good shows to go uh, unmentioned because you're not getting the shock value of people shitting on things and people flocking to it. I'm watching through season three of Orville, which has been fucking amazing. And I will tell you that with the exception of episode nine and 10, I will take most of the season three Orville episodes over any of this other that, that, that Orville is a better product than the majority of strange new worlds. And that's another show that I haven't heard anybody say a fucking peep about. So uh, certainly, yeah, you, you've got this thing's got a deep grave to dig itself out of courtesy of everything else Alex Kurtzman has done. Uh, but what, where's where's the eyeballs? Where's the clicks uh, that are going to come in just by saying, hey, this is really great. You should watch it. Well, I guess we'll find out ourselves, right? <laughs> one way, one way or another. Although this will remain for our patrons for some time. Thanks again, guys, for your continued financial support. We appreciate it, and we hope you've enjoyed our thoughts about Strange New Worlds, which is basically, yeah, it's pretty good. You should go watch it. 